Good morning, I'm Father X, and today we'll continue our journey through the world of child custody case law. Let's make this more real to help you prepare for your custody trial. Today, we'll deep dive into an actual custody case. If we go to Google Scholar and we select the Illinois Appellate and Supreme Courts, we get the search page for those courts in Illinois. If we enter a search for the best interest of the child, and then on the left-hand column we select cases since 2019, the Jameson v. Williams case pops up. It's 10 pages long, which is longer than usual, but I want to review it because there's a lot of good content here for you. The first page tells us that it's Eric Jameson v. Courtney Williams, a 2020 decision by the Appellate Court of Illinois, 3rd District. I'll just read portions of the case because it's too long for this video, but I encourage you to find it and read it entirely to get you started on case law. Since this is from Illinois, you can use it as guidance if you're in Illinois, but even if you're outside of Illinois, you can use this as an example of how to read and interpret prior cases when you search cases in your own state. The first paragraph says, The circuit court entered an order allocating to the petitioner, Eric Jameson, primary parental decision-making authority for educational and healthcare decisions, and the majority of parenting time. The respondent, Courtney Williams, appealed, arguing that the court's rulings were against the manifest weight of the evidence. We affirm. So now we know the lower court gave primary residential and legal custody to the father. The mother appealed, but the appellate court affirmed the lower court's decision. The rest of the case tells us why, which is what you need to know. There are several pages of facts that tell the story of the two parents and child in this case. Towards the end, the appellate court states what the law is, and then they apply the facts to the law and agree with the lower court's ruling. I'll read through the facts presented. See how these stories tie into the best interest factors stated in the law. Think about what facts in my case can I present in my trial to get 50-50 or primary custody? This will help you prepare your case for that end goal. Let's briefly start with Illinois law, so you can see how the stories connect to the law. Each paragraph in this case is numbered, so it's easy to find the paragraphs that I refer to. For legal custody and decision making, the appellate court says in paragraph 47 that a circuit court shall allocate decision making responsibilities according to the child's best interests. The court must consider all relevant factors, including, they list 15 factors, and three of them are, Number four, the ability of the parents to cooperate to make decisions or the level of conflict between the parents. Five, the level of each parent's participation in past significant decision-making with respect to the child. Six, any prior agreement or course of conduct between the parties relating to decision-making with respect to the child. For physical custody, the appellate court says in paragraph 53, a circuit court must allocate parenting time according to the best interests of the child. The court must consider all relevant factors, including, and they list 17, but I'll highlight just a few. Number seven, the mental and physical health of all individuals involved. Nine, the distance between the parents' residences, each parent's and the child's daily schedules, and the ability of the parents to cooperate in the arrangement. Number 11, the physical violence or threat of physical violence by the child's parents directed against the child or other members of the child's household. Number 12, the willingness and ability of each parent to place the needs of the child ahead of his or her own needs. And number 13, the willingness and ability of each parent to facilitate and encourage a close and continuing relationship between the parent, the other parent and the child. Here's how the appellate court summarized this case. I'll read directly from the case, but we'll skip through some parts for the sake of time. Paragraphs three to five say, on October 2018, Eric filed a petition to establish a parent-child relationship, parenting responsibilities, and parenting time with AJ, born September 2017, the child whom he had with Courtney. So we know AJ was one to three years old during this process. In the petition, Eric sought sole decision-making responsibilities and primary residential status with majority parenting time. The parties entered into an agreed order on December 2018, 
under which they would have shared care decision-making of AJ on a temporary basis. They also temporarily agreed to follow the advice of the minor's primary care physician if they could not agree on any health care decision. Regarding visitation, they agreed to alternate weeks with the minor. While Eric was working during the week, Courtney, who was unemployed, would have the minor between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. The parties also agreed to a mutual stay-away order. One day later, Courtney filed a counter-petition, which sought sole decision-making responsibilities and a majority of the parenting time. Before I continue, please like, subscribe, and share. Also, if you find this information helpful, please support this channel. Donate on my YouTube channel's About page using PayPal or Venmo. Back to this case. Paragraph 6 says, during the pendency of the petitions, the acrimonious nature of the dispute became evident. The parties filed for orders of protection against each other. The circuit court had ordered the parties not to communicate unless an emergency arose with a minor. In June 2019, Eric filed a petition to enforce the temporary order of December 2018, alleging that Courtney had withheld the minor from, minor from Eric for scheduled visitations and failed to adhere to requirements for exchanges. And then things changed when in paragraph 7 the court says, On October 9, 2019, Eric filed an emergency petition to modify parenting time. He alleged Courtney was now living in a dry cleaning business that did not have a bathtub, shower, or kitchen. That Courtney's mother expressed to Eric concerns about Courtney's mental health due to witnessing instances of verbal abuse and threats made against the child's well-being, and that Courtney had unilaterally scheduled an appointment with another doctor. Eric expressed concern as Courtney had returned the minor to Eric after a six-hour visit in the same diaper that the minor was wearing at the initial exchange, in improper clothing, and with a full diaper with rash on multiple occasions. And the court tells us that's when Eric got temporary primary custody pending the trial. Paragraph 9 tells us, Eric called several witnesses whom he knew personally through his job as a funeral director and his role as the McDonough County coroner. These witnesses testified Eric's residence was clean and appropriate and, th and that he was a good parent. None of these witnesses had seen any inappropriate parenting by Courtney. Paragraph 12 tells us, In his role as funeral director, his usual hours were weekdays from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Visitations could also occur on weeknights, but he would typically be home by 8.15 p.m. on those nights. Visitations and funerals would also be held on weekends. Another employee had been taking most of the calls about deaths during weeks that he had the minor. When he has had to take late-night calls, he had been able to secure a sitter. He would call his mother or sister, and the minor would continue to sleep through the night uninterrupted. Paragraph 14 says, at times, Eric would bring the minor to work with him, including times when Courtney did not show up for the morning exchange and instead dropped her off with Eric at his workplace. Paragraph 15 tells us that Eric testified that Courtney had an unstable living environment, saying, Initially, she moved or was staying at her former stepfather's place, and then she moved in with her friend, Mercedes. She was asked to leave there. Then she went to an apartment on Maple Avenue. From there, she went and stayed in a hotel for a period, and then with her friend Anna at a trailer park here. And then she went and lived in Springfield with her mom. She lived at her former business at the dry cleaner. And she has an apartment now somewhere in town. Paragraph 16 says, Eric also testified that Courtney had withheld the minor from him on numerous occasions, and it goes on to state specific and exact instances of this. Paragraph 18 says, The minor's primary care physician testified the minor had not been brought in for her routine well child checkups between 10 days after her birth in September 2017 and October 2018. Three appointments had been canceled, and one appointment was a no-show. The minor was behind on vaccinations. And I think all of that was before petitions were filed while the mother had custody. Paragraph 22 quotes Eric saying, Eric stated that he had concerns about Courtney's mental health, 
claiming that when she gets upset about something, it seems as if she's unable to control her emotions and what she'll say, and she'll say anything to do anything to hurt whoever it is she's upset with and say things that are completely untrue to anybody. Paragraph 23 says, Eric further stated that he knew several members of Courtney's family and that he has granted the maternal grandmother's requests to see the minor. He also always allowed Courtney's requests to have additional time with the minor, with the exception of one last minute request. Paragraph 24 says that Eric alleged that since October 23, 2019, Courtney had declined to exercise parenting time with a minor five or six times on weekdays, had not exercised any parenting time on weekends, and tended to inform him at the last minute about it. And it talks about an occasion where the next morning, Courtney came to the funeral home and asked for the minor. She indicated to me that she had the right of first refusal and had until 8 o'clock each morning to make that right of refusal. Eric had already arranged for a sitter because he had not heard from Courtney. In response, Courtney called the police and then the FBI. Paragraph 25 tells a story when Courtney left Eric's workplace with the minor, who vomited while in her car seat during the ride. Courtney returned to Eric's workplace and demanded that I change out her car seat for my car seat. He told her that he had to meet with a family that morning, so he did not have time to take care of that situation. Courtney demanded again that Eric swap out the car seats and threatened to call the police. She did, in fact, call the police. Then we begin to hear the other side of the story. Paragraph 36 tells us, Courtney claimed Eric was abusive from the very beginning, of their relationship and that everything had to be done his way. He got upset quickly, had a bad temper, including while in the minor's presence. Paragraph 39 says, Courtney claimed Eric smoked marijuana multiple times per day, every day for three years. She had witnessed him use opioids recreationally on several occasions. On rebuttal, Eric denied using marijuana three times per day. He stated he used it approximately once per week when he mowed his lawn. He also said he had never used it around the minor. He also denied taking opioids recreationally. Paragraph 41 says, Courtney also alleged that Eric had threatened to kill her in August 2018. They were in the middle of an argument and while Eric was holding the minor. Paragraph 42 tells us, that the lower court gave Eric primary residential and legal custody because one, the parties were both physically healthy enough to parent the minor, two, the allegation of physical abuse related to Courtney's bruised arms took place before the minor was born, three, the parties both needed to do a better job of fostering a relationship between the minor and the other parent, four, it was bothersome that Eric smoked marijuana, but doing so was going to be legal in a few days anyway, Five, there was no corroboration of the specific allegations of drug use by Eric that Courtney had alleged. And six, Courtney's housing situation was unstable. In paragraph 47, the appellate court tells us, a reviewing court will not disturb a circuit court's ruling unless that decision is against the manifest weight of the evidence. A decision is against the manifest weight of the evidence when an opposite conclusion is apparent or when the court's findings appear to be unreasonable, arbitrary, or not based on evidence. Look at the other appellate court rulings shown here and read them to expand your knowledge of relevant case law. But think about this concept of reversing the lower court's ruling. You can interpret this in a negative or positive way. The negative way is to assume the higher court won't overturn the lower court and you have no chance at an appeal. However, look at this in a positive way. If the actual facts of your case are reviewed by an objective, intelligent person, would they think the father in your case should have custody? If the answer is yes, then present the facts of your case during the trial as best you can, showing how the total circumstance proves you should be a 50-50 or primary custodial parent. If you don't present your case clearly, your judge can't know the actual facts. If you think the judge ruled against you based on incompetent analysis or gender discrimination, then you can appeal and tell the appellate court that the judge's findings were unreasonable, arbitrary, or not based on evidence. 
In paragraph 49, the appellate court summarizes key facts, saying, The evidence in this case clearly showed the parties had a toxic relationship, and both Eric and Courtney were responsible for some questionable decision-making. Nevertheless, as the court noted, both parents appeared fit to care for the minor. Significantly, most of the testimony presented by one side was contested by the other. While we in no way intend to minimize the importance of the allegations of physical abuse by Eric, we note that most of the evidence in this regard was also conflicting. The only portion of that evidence that was not in dispute was the incident in which Eric poked Courtney's leg and caused bruising. However, that incident occurred before Courtney was even pregnant. Eric had shown remorse for his actions. And Courtney apparently attempted to portray that incident to the police as occurring two years later than it actually occurred. We see no error in the circuit court's findings that Courtney's housing situation was still unstable. There was no dispute that Courtney had borne the bulk of responsibility for failing to secure routine wellness checkups for the minor or that Eric had been able to secure adequate child care for the minor during times when he was needed for work. And in paragraph 51, the appellate court concludes, It is clear that the circuit court thoroughly reviewed the applicable statutory factors in assessing the evidence. Under these circumstances, we hold that the circuit court's ruling on decision-making responsibilities is not against the manifest weight of the evidence. Imagine if you presented your case with relevant facts like this. Think about what facts do I need to present into evidence so the lower court and appellate court would agree that I should be the primary custodial parent. Plan your testimony and evidence to get the conclusion you want. Remember, this is just one case and it won't be the answer to all your prayers. But when you read dozens of these, you'll accumulate knowledge and learn how to think, speak, and write like an appellate court judge. And that's how you can begin to corner and control your trial judge in your custody case. These might be the darkest days of your life, they were for me. I'm making these educational videos to help you navigate this nightmare. If you subscribe, you can get updates when I post more videos. Thank you for liking, subscribing, and sharing with your friends who are in a similar situation. If you like, subscribe, and share, it'll help get this message out to more fathers. Please support this channel so I can make more videos. You can donate via my YouTube channel's about page using PayPal or Venmo.